the word is the character of one who can be relied upon. It's about being dependable, having this dependency. And so like all other fruits, faithfulness is again grounded in the character of God because it's a fruit of the Spirit after all and it's got to come through the Spirit. We can't just try to muster up faithfulness on our own no more than we can peace and joy and love, all those things. It comes from the Lord. It's from Him. And it is impossible to be faithful without Him. If we look at our own lives and the things that we try in our own strength to be faithful in and we fail over and over, I can think of my own life as well, that, you know, in our own strength, we are doomed to fail. We, we don't have that faithfulness. But when we rest in the Lord and we trust in the Lord, it's His faithfulness that we need to grasp a hold of. It's His faithfulness that we want to be grounded upon. Now, God's character is faithful. That is who He is. He's faithful by nature. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. And I love that. We might be faithless. We might fail, but he won't. It's his very nature. He has to deny himself who he is if he's going to be faithless. If he's going to fail in that way, he remains faithful. That's who he is, his, his character. And when the Lord revealed himself to Moses, you know, when he was in the cleft of the rock and he passed by, he said, merciful and gracious, that he was slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He is abounding in faithfulness. He's just faithful through and through. Psalm 36, verse 5, again, it says, your faithful love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. It reaches far, far above us, far above that we can see. His faithfulness extends that way. Psalm 119, Verse 89 to 90 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. And here it equates faithfulness to the word, God's word. His faithfulness is, is in his word as well. His word is settled in the heavens. It's firm. It's not going anywhere. And neither is he. he is, he's dependable. He is, his word is an expression of his character, and that is how faithful he is. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his people. And his faithfulness is a comfort. It should become that comfort to us. It's reassurance to us. You know, we might be faithless sometimes. We may fail, but he won't. And that's our comfort. That's what we rest in. We don't have to fear that because he is faithful. This world, there's not a lot we can depend upon. It changes all the time. There's a lot of faithless people. There's a lot of people that um, are not reliable. There's a lot of things, a lot of institutions that are not reliable. We cannot rely on the things of this world, but we can rest assured that we can rely on the Word of God and the character of God. We can rely upon Him, and that really is the only thing we have to rely on. And we know we look at the world around us, and we see things changing and shaking, and you know we see all that's happening. But God is not shaken. He's not changing. He is faithful. He's steadfast. He's always there. He's immovable. And this is what we place our faithfulness on. But also faithfulness is exemplified in the character of Christ too. John 17, 4, 
When Jesus was praying, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you have sent me to do. I love that. I love that verse because it, it shows you those two aspects of faithfulness, glorifying the Lord. Jesus said, I have glorified you. That's a part of faithfulness, being faithful to glorify God, that our works glorify him, but also faithfulness to finish, to endure it and to finish it. So everything that Jesus did, he glorified God, but he finished it too. He was faithful until the end. And those are the aspects of faithfulness. Now, faithfulness needs to be cultivated in us. It's something that his people need to cultivate. And as I said, you know, faithfulness is not going to be produced by our own efforts. Um, but I did hear somebody say, you can't get faithful by trying, and yet you can't get faithful without trying. So it kind of seems a bit of a paradox. Um, but we can't get faithful in our own strength. However, we do need to be faithful Revelation 20 says, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. We're commanded to be faithful. There is that effort required on our part. We have to examine our faithlessness maybe and see where we fall short and then we have to be faithful. It's being. We have to be it first and then it becomes an action. So it's got to work in our lives. First of all, the spirit working in our lives, his faithfulness, and then we walk out his faithfulness. It's, it needs to become an action. Faithfulness is always going to be that action, that end result as well. And the other thing about faithfulness is it's exactly what it says. We need faith. To have faithfulness, we've got to have faith. It requires an element of faith in there. It's to be full of faith. So that we have to have, we have to be filled with faith as well, in order to complete what the Lord has set before us, in order to see that task before us and do it, in order to be dependable. We've got to have the faith in God. We have to know where we're rooted. If we want that dependence, we want to be reliable, we want to endure to the end, we need to be rooted and grounded in the faith in Christ. That's where our roots need to be if we want that. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We hold fast to our hope, and that's faithfulness because he is faithful. So we can endure that faithfulness. So faith is trusting in the character of God before we see how things are going to work out. We don't know the end, but we need to have faith to endure to the end. We're not going to know, but God knows. And we have to put our trust in him. Our faith enables us to walk out in that that God has put before us. And to develop our faithfulness, we need to get to know him. We have to know his character. When we know somebody, we can depend on them more. When we know God more, we can depend on him more. We can practice that faithfulness so much more because we know him more. So we have to learn about him. We have to learn to hear his voice as well. Practice hearing his voice. Practice hearing him speak to us so that we know the difference between his voice, the world's voice, our voice, or the people's voice. You know, we have to practice that. And then we can learn to be faithful. And also remembering God's faithfulness in our lives, in our past lives. Well, not past lives, but in our past. We remember his faithfulness. And remember his faithfulness in the Word as well. Reading the Word, seeing how he was faithful to the men of the Bible and how he'll be faithful to us. This remembrance cultivates a faithfulness in us that we can then walk out in what God has put before us. So then our faithfulness, the Lord requires his servants to be faithful. Luke chapter 9, you can turn there if you want to, verses 57 to 62. So it says, verse 57, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have, holes and foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. 
Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And here Jesus, you know, at this end, he says, no one having put his hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom of God. When we make that decision to follow him, we have to make sure that we don't have all these excuses and all these distractions. God desires his servants to be without excuses, without distractions. He wants them just to focus on him and him alone. We need to recognize maybe our excuses, maybe those distractions that possibly come into our lives that take our hands off the plow. But here Jesus says, no, you don't need to do this and you don't need to do that. You need to follow me. This is what I've said. Follow me. Don't turn. And I love the image of the plowing because, you know, many of you know when you plow a field, you have to look straight ahead. If you don't, it wobbles. The line gets wobbly and it swerves and you don't plow your field straight. And the first time you plow your field also sets the standard to the other rows that you're going to plow as well. It sets that standard. So when you begin, you want to begin straight ahead. Now, God you know, he doesn't want his rows straight because he's OCD or he's a perfectionist and he likes the look of straight lines. That's not the reason, you know. He's not bothered about the look of his field. He wants them straight because that's the most productive. You're going to get the most fruit out of that field when you plow it right. You're going to get that most fruit. And that's what he wants. He wants the fruit. He wants the, the productiveness of that faithfulness, of looking ahead. That's why he said, just look ahead. Look at me, and the most fruit is going to come out of it. We want to plow our field straight. We want the most fruit coming from our faithfulness. Now, I've got three areas that we can look at for being faithful and that we can be faithful in. First of all, we can be faithful in our circumstances, in our calling, and in our commitments. Now, they all begin with a C, so that's nice and easy. And I get brownie points for alliteration there. Makes it good to remember. So we want to be faithful in our circumstances. Now, this is the situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, we all have different circumstances. But if you look around, you probably find you have lots of different circumstances as well. Your circumstances could be that you're married. You could be single. You could have children. Uh, you could be an employer. You could be an employee. You know, there's a lot of different circumstances that we're each going to be in, but we need to be faithful in that situation that we're in. If we're married, faithfulness is vital. It's a must. You know, fidelity, we have to have that faithfulness in our marriage, physically, but also emotionally as well, and mentally. We have to make sure that our minds are not wandering to where they shouldn't be going. We need to make sure that our emotions aren't as well. We have to be faithful to our husbands. We need to be giving our husbands all, everything. You know, the marriage vows, we, we give him everything. All of us don't withhold things from him. We don't hold it back. He's entitled to everything. When we marry him, we deem him worthy to give all of ourselves to. And that's what we have to do. We have to fulfill that commitment that we give to him. We don't begrudge him. It, it's easy to get annoyed with our husbands, the little bits that he does. You know, we can find we get begrudging, but that's not faithfulness. When we get annoyed, when we get, you know, angry with them, it's our attitude. We have to check our attitudes. Are our attitudes faithful to our husbands, you know? Many women can remain married to the same man, but they can moan their heads off about them as well and be annoyed with them their whole life. But that's not an attitude of faithfulness. We want to cultivate that attitude of faithfulness towards our husbands too. Singleness. You know, if we're in a season of singleness or a lifetime of singleness as well, the Lord wants us to be faithful. Faithful to that freedom that you might have. Not necessarily concerned with the future, not worried or consumed about what you may want to have or what you don't have, but giving everything to the Lord, giving it to Him, allowing Him to direct your path and giving you those opportunities to serve Him. Paul, 
He said, I wish everybody was single because I've got all the time in the world to serve the Lord. You know, and a married person might think, oh, yeah, if only, you know, married with kids, if only I had all the time to do whatever I wanted. And, you know, and then the single's like, oh, if only I had family to serve. And, but you know what? We have to be faithful in that position that we're in. And if we've got, if we've got singleness, then we've got that freedom to serve the Lord in what he gives our way and how we can do that. And so we look to the Lord. If we're a parent, faithful to our children, faithful to nurture them, faithful to correct them, to comfort them, to exalt them, to discipline them. We have to carry on that faithfulness to our children as well, all that the Lord says. Faithful to teach them right from wrong, not just you know the right in the world's eyes, but God's right from the world's right as well. We have to teach them that kind of rightness too. Faithful to teach them, but also faithful to give them that wings to fly as well as they get older. We have to equip our children to live lives on their own, to live lives hopefully in the faith of God, that they would lead their life out in the Lord, that they can hear from the Lord, that they can walk in the Lord. We need to train them to do that but also leave them in the Lord's hands. You know, that he can speak to them. He will nurture them as they get older. We have to know the difference between training a young child and giving an older one their wings to fly away and to be dependent and to be dependent of us as well. We're women. We love it when people are dependent on us. You know, I, we gain our identity a lot by people being in, by, you know, dependent on us. We love caring. We love nurturing. But there comes a time when we have to allow our children allow other people to stand on their own and to find their wings to fly, hopefully in the Lord, to you know, do the Lord's will as well. That's part of parenting. It's a big part of parenting too. If we're a child, and I know we're not like young children, but some of us still have parents, we still need to be faithful to our parents, to honor them, to respect them, you know, to look after them in their old age, to be there to care for them as well. They're, they're our parents. We're to be faithful to them, called to love them as well. You know, we, we might be tempted to think they're just oh, dithering old people, you know, <laughs> they just go on and on, not that I ever would, you know. Would never think that, <laughs> ever. But sometimes we might just think, oh, no, we need to be faithful to them as they get older. They're our parents. They looked after us. We look after them too. We give them our faithfulness. If you're an employer, you need to be faithful to those people that you are giving a wage to. If you said you're going to give them that wage, give them that wage. You know, you need to treat them with respect. You need to treat them fairly as well. Give them a fair wage. If you're employing somebody, give them a fair wage. Their wage is what they're due. You know, be fair. If you're an employee as well, be fair too. Work the hours that you're contracted. Work the hours you said you would. Be faithful in that. Be dependable. Do what you say. If you're going to write an email, write the email. If you're going to make a meeting, set up a meeting, go to that meeting. Be on time. Do what you are supposed to be doing, what that person is paying you to do. Don't take advantage if you've got an easy boss. You know, don't take advantage of them, but be faithful to them. Be honoring to them. This is you. This is your employee. And if you're your boss is, you know, kind and lenient, you're still working for the Lord. The Lord still sees. The Lord knows what you're doing as well. And so be faithful to your employer as well. The circumstances are also maybe the trials that we find ourselves in. Could be this lockdown that we all find ourselves in. But we still need to be faithful. We need to be faithful to the Lord. We might not know what we need to be faithful to at the moment, certain things, but we know for sure we need to be faithful to God and trust in Him that He is here with us. He will take us through those trials. He will take us through those times. We have to be faithful in the here, in the now, in the present. Can't hide, can't run from it, but let's be faithful in it. And so the second thing is our calling. Now, our calling is is definitely linked to our circumstances. You know, if, if we're a parent, that's our calling. If we're a wife, that's our calling. You know, if we're single, that's our calling. You know, if we work, that's usually our calling as well. The Lord has put you in that place to work, and he's probably called you there too. So it's most definitely going to be linked to those circumstances. But calling can go a step further 
as well. Calling can be just a little bit more than maybe a parent or, or the job that you're doing. Your first and foremost calling is to worship and glorify God. That's your first calling. And I don't just mean glorifying God in your work, because we need to do that. Everything we do, we need to glorify the Lord. But there are moments we just need to stop and glorify the Lord. We've just done it. We've just sang some songs where we can just sit and glorify him, praise him, worship him. The Lord wants us to do that. Take those moments just to think about him and him alone. You know, how hard is that? It's hard. I know. I I love spending every morning in the Bible, but boy, do you have to train your mind back to the Lord. You know, your mind wanders. No, back to the Lord. Worship him. Think about him. I want to sit before Jesus. It is my calling to honor him, to actually proclaim him, to glorify him, to tell him he's great, to tell him he's worthy. You know, how many times do we sit and go, gosh, you're good. You're in the silence, not necessarily just in church where other people can hear us, but in the silence of our own home to say, God, you are good. You're worthy to be praised. That's our calling. Psalm 89, one says, with my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. That's what we're called to do. Make him known, but to glorify him, to worship him. Our calling might also involve using our gifts and our talents that the Lord has given us. You know, those natural gifts that he gives us that are from him, we can use them for his glory, not for our glory, not to seek attention, not just for ourselves, but for him for his glory. Where are we using those gifts that God has given us to glorify him? Are they for him? Are they for us? But also in this area of calling as well, sometimes we need to step out in faith. Sometimes the Lord calls us to do something that is not our gift. And they can sometimes be the best callings because that's when you really feel the Lord work is when you have to step out in that faith. You might think, I'm not natural at doing something, therefore the Lord doesn't want me to do it. That might not be the case. You know, Paul says, when I am weak, he is strong. He says that his strength is made perfect in weakness. And sometimes we need to lean into our weakness to feel his strength. And that's the best kind of calling, really, is when we use our weakness And the Lord uses it to his glory. And you know that's the Lord. It wasn't me. It wasn't me naturally. That was God. That's the best kind of of use, I think, that the Lord can really do through us is, is when we give our weaknesses to him. We have to exercise areas of our faith that we don't normally exercise when we can naturally do something. You know, we we have to exercise another part of faith and we have to exercise that area of faithfulness as well, being faithful in something we might feel a little bit uncomfortable in. You know, it might feel awkward, but if the Lord has called you to do it, the Lord will give you that strength to do it, and that's where you draw close to him, and that's where you feel his power the most, is when he lifts you up in that weakness. So our calling is going to require faith. It's going to require faith to fulfill it, and it's going to require faith to endure it. Now, the part of calling, sometimes, you know, we might think, I don't know what my calling is. You know, sometimes you want a specific calling to be, you know, a pianist, to be a violinist, or, you know, to be an artist, paint pictures. But, you know, sometimes it could be just to be a mother, just to, you know, be in the job that you're in, just to be faithful in that. Sometimes that's your calling. Sometimes the Lord might lead you in another calling too. And if we want to, you know, know your calling, we need to know the Lord. We have to get to know him. Seek him out. If we want to seek the Lord and think, has the Lord got something different? We have to know him. And also I love the thing that Elizabeth Elliot says, if we are lost and floundering in our calling, she simply says to do the next thing. That's all. Just do the next thing and let the Lord lead you. And that's one of the greatest advices. You want to know what the Lord's calling is? Do the next thing. He'll lead you into that calling that he has for you. And we can discover what he wants. So then the third thing, commitments. So now our commitments will stem from our circumstances and our calling. It's going to naturally 
You know, those commitments that we make as a parent, as in, in our jobs, we're going to have those commitments. We might have commitments that we know through our calling that we're going to make. So they're naturally going to come from both our circumstances and our calling. And we have to ask ourselves, are we being faithful to our commitments? The things that we said, I'm going to do. Things we've said, okay, sign me up for. I'll do that. You know, the long-term things in parenting and our work commitments, but also the little things as well that we say we're going to do, we say we're going to commit to. Now, if we find ourselves being unfaithful to our commitments, if we want to look at all our commitments and think, ah, I'm being a little bit faithful, we might want to see which end of the scale that we're going on. There, there's some people that I know that are failing in their commitments because they have so many of them. You know, they think that they've got about 67 hours in the day when only they have 24 like the rest of us. But they, they love to do things. They love to fill their plate. Maybe they feel guilty. They don't want to say no. But they could be excited and just passionate about doing everything. They fill their plate so full, there's no way they're going to do it. They can't get through that, and they find they're dropping the ball out. You're missing this and not doing that and not able to give, send that email and not getting back to that person and not, there's just not enough time in the day to do everything that they want to do. So then just lighten the load a little bit. You know, if the balls are dropping, you got to let them drop. You got to decide, okay, what are these commitments are not matching up to my circumstances or my calling? What are these commitments are things that I might need to let go of in order to be faithful to the commitments I'm making? What do I need to let go of? Do I need to evaluate, you know, reevaluate some things? You know, what, what do? What is priority? What's the most important thing? I'll give you the answer. It's God, okay? So there, if you're struggling, God most important. Take it from there. But then there's those people on the other end of the scale. Those that don't, they're not faithful in their commitments because they don't make any. And they're afraid to make any commitments. Maybe they're afraid to fail in those commitments. But you're not going to be faithful unless you actually make a commitment to be faithful to. Nobody's going to know if you're faithful. You have to make those commitments. You have to put something on your plate to be committed to. Now, sometimes that's by choice. Some people, you know, just are afraid of commitments, don't like that you know, shy away from it, they don't do it. Some, some people might find themselves there um, by chance. You know, it may be through this lockdown, you're on furlough. It may be that, you know, redundancies and losing jobs and just not having anything on your plate. You know, there's a lot of emptiness. And how do we become faithful in that emptiness? You know, as from what I'm seeing, you know, on Facebook and what I'm hearing about, there just seems to be a lot of people that are like squandering their days in their, you know, jimmy jammies all day long. They've lost in boredom, maybe. I, I don't know. It kind of seems like there's a whole culture of pajamas going on, pajama-wearing people. I love pajamas. I like them. Um, but I have a mental connection with pajamas, and it tells me that I'm doing nothing. If I'm wearing pajamas, my mind says, rest and do nothing. I'm either sick or I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not doing anything. I put my pajamas on, and Bryce knows the signal. Oh, you've got people on pajamas on. Yeah, that's it. You're done. <laughs> you, know, you got nothing out of me. You know, he knows the thing. It's kind of like the high priest. I always think of it like the high priest. You know, when Jesus says he sat down at the right hand of God, and when they sit down, that's it. He's done. I said, it is done. I sit down. And that's kind of like me. I put my, it's done. No, I, I'm not going to let the dog out. Somebody else is going to have to do that. Not getting, I'm done. I'm just done. I have like this mental association with pajamas and just resting and being done. You know, I'm not going to garden in my pajamas. I'm not going to go for a walk in them. I'm not going to clean in them. I'm not going to spend my day in them. <laughs> you know, if, if I have got stuff to do, I'm not going to be in my pajamas, and sometimes, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I do love them, they're cuddly, they're snuggly, I get it, get why people do, but sometimes, if you need to be faithful in your day, you need to position yourself to be faithful. For me, wearing pajamas would not get me to do anything. I'm not going to be faithful to do anything. I'm just going to Netflix binge and play on some game and, you know, waste my time. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not really fit to plow the field, 
because you can't plow a field wearing your pajamas. And they, you know, lockdown, I have to say, maybe I'm odd. I feel like everybody else is wearing pajamas when I'm, <laughs> on a Sunday morning, I got dressed up in lockdown, even though we, I had to put my dress on. Sorry, it's kind of weird, but I had to put my dress on. This is a Sunday. I'm still going to do it. I still want to worship. And even now, I get up, I want to put something on that motivates me to get my work done. You know, I have to put myself in a position to do it. I remember reading, and this is a really good book. If you don't have much on your plate, this is a good book to read. It is The Prisoners of Hope. Um, Dana Curry, Heather Mercer. And they were in Afghanistan. They were missionaries, and they were jailed. Um, some of you might remember on the news that they made worldwide news. And it's a brilliant story. But in it, there's a part which I did not understand at the time. And they're in jail. And they ask their friends and family for things. They, or their friends and family says, what would you like us to send you? Because they could send them packages. And you know what they asked for? They asked for makeup. I remember reading that thinking, what? You're in jail. You need makeup for. Nobody sees you. What do you need it for? But they felt like they needed makeup to make themselves feel human. And, you know, through lockdown, as I've gotten older, I understand that now. I understand why they wanted that makeup. They wanted to feel human. You know, they, they just wanted to increase their, I guess, their mental stability, what we would say now. And so sometimes if we want to be faithful, and if they wanted to faithfully look upon the Lord, they're like, okay, let's just put some makeup on. You know, if we need to just put some makeup on, put yourself in a position where you're going to be faithful to the Lord, it's okay. You know, I thought that was a bit vain of them, but now I see. No, there's some mornings I get up, I'm not seeing anybody, but I'm putting the makeup on. My girls will look at me and go, are you going somewhere, Mom? I've got like a suit on. I thought, I'm going somewhere. No, no, I've got work to do, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, nobody sees. But you know what God sees? And my husband sees too. He actually appreciates it. Okay, like, yeah, you're looking nice. <laughs> you know, so what if nobody sees? That's not why we do it. We don't do faithfulness for people seeing as well. We do it to position ourselves, to be faithful. So on either one of those, those scales, and we need to, um, you know, this whole thought of people not seeing, it can be kind of dangerous, can't it? Because we're all locked in our houses right now. Nobody sees. Nobody sees what you're doing. You don't see what I'm doing. You know, you don't see if I'm being faithful. I don't see if you are. But God sees. He is seeing. And we have to be mindful of that as well. We have to be mindful that we might create a culture of, well, nobody's seeing. I'm getting away with it. God sees and he's looking. He's looking for his faithful servants. He rewards the faithful. He punishes the unfaithful as well. So in order to be a faithful person, we need to make commitments. We need to fulfill those commitments. Matthew 25, 14, verse 14 through 30. How much time do I have? How long am I going? Yeah, need to get on. Okay, verse 14. Jesus said, he told a parable. For the kingdom of heaven, and you know this paragraph. It's going to be a simple one to you. In the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling to a far country. He called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according Turn the page. to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And I love that. And when I read that through today, he gave them their talents, the number of talents to their ability. Now the emphasis is not the number, the emphasis is their ability. Then he came, then he who received his five talents went, traded them, and he made five. And likewise, he who had two gained two more also. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who received five talents came and brought five more talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What a beautiful verse. It's just a wonderful verse, I think, for every Christian to hear. 
He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Exactly the same thing. Now, the one with 10 and then one got four, it didn't matter the number of talents that they produced. You know, God didn't go, well done, but you're not as good as him. Never said that. He said, well done. He said exactly the same thing because the point wasn't necessarily the number. The point was the faithfulness. The point was what they did with the talents that they got. So then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. And that is so typical, isn't it? Always got to blame someone else. Lord, you're harsh. I didn't do anything with my talent. It's your fault because you're mean and nasty and I don't like you. <laughs> you know? That's kind of typical. It's somebody else's fault. This is, this is why I didn't produce anything. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The unfaithful servant, he was lazy, he was wicked, and he just hid that one servant. And it's interesting in the beginning that God gave them the number of talents according to their ability. He had the ability to do something good with that one. The Lord knew that. You've got that ability, but he squandered the ability. He was too lazy to use that ability. He only had one, you know, and we've been there, right? You give one job, you've got one job. You only got the one thing to do, and you couldn't even do that, and he couldn't. He was too lazy, and it's interesting because I remember a few years ago um, reading something. It said, if you want a job done, give it to somebody that's busy. You know, give it to somebody that has nothing to do. There's a reason they have nothing to do. You know, they're not doing anything. Give it to somebody that's busy. And that, that can be true sometimes. That is true. He only had one talent, and he squandered it. But it was the faithful ones, the ones that took their talents, and the ones that used it wisely. And that's what the Lord is looking for, that good, that faithful. And it's faithfulness. In the few things. First Timothy 1.12 says that he counted me faithful, put me into the ministry. The requirement for stewards in the ministry is faithfulness. It is a requirement. But in order to be counted faithful, we have to start with the small things. Do those little things. We have to prove that we can be faithful in the small things, just like he said. He said, good and faithful servant, you were faithful over a few. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You're faithful over a few. You've proved it. And you can be ruler over many. And then enter into the joy. That's where the joy is. And I love that. Being faithful actually produces joy. Having that responsibility and fulfilling that responsibility, it produces that joy. But here's the, you know, the reasons why we're not faithful. This, this servant himself, well, he was lazy. He was wicked. Laziness will hinder our faithfulness. We can't be faithful if we're being lazy. But the other thing as well is despising those small things. Is looking at the small things in life and going, oh, that's not worth my time. I don't want to do that. I want the bigger things. I want to clean the toilet. I don't want to work in the Sunday school. I want a vacuum. What do I want to do that for? I want the big things, you know. I want to go talk to the millions. I want a YouTube channel. I want everybody to see me. You know, well, I want to listen to somebody that can't clean a toilet, mop a floor. I want to see how they can wash the feet of the disciples. I want to see how they can serve the body of Christ. How can they reach out to people in the simple ways? And if they do that successfully, 
Just like the law says, you give them more. They become ruler over many things. The third thing, as I've said about faithfulness that can hinder our faithfulness, is a lack of faith. Pure and simple, a lack of faith. Because faithfulness is, it is being dependable, it's doing a job well, it's doing a job to the end, but it also might be doing a job that you might find unexpected, you might not feel called, worthy to do. Sometimes our unworthiness can hinder our faith, our doubt. I think of the children of Israel when they said, we felt like grasshoppers in their sight. They didn't enter into the land or conquer the land because they felt like they're grasshoppers. They're giants and I'm tiny and I can't do that. And they were un faithful. They were disobedient. And sometimes that feeling of unworthiness can overwhelm us that it hinders our faithfulness. And I don't know if you've been there. I know I have. I know I've been there so many times. About a year ago, over a year ago, I had an idea. And I don't know if it's me, you know, if I've been around Bryce too long, that I'm having all these ideas. He's rubbed off onto me, you know. You know, you get an idea. Is that God or is it me? I don't know. So you ponder it. You wait a little bit. I then got the guts to tell Bryce, and of course Bryce being Bryce is like, yeah, that's awesome, do it. I love it. You know, he's like kind anyway. Yeah, ideas, ideas, have more. Do it, do it, yay. So I thought about it, I'm like, it's not me. It's not a gift I have. It's not a talent I possess. It's probably the hardest thing I would have to do. It's just, no, I don't even know why I would want to. I don't want to, and yet I want to. But I felt so unworthy, and as I'm praying, as I'm seeking the Lord, like, I don't know. There was a deadline. I actually had a deadline. And I, I, you know, procrastinated so long. And that deadline passed. And as soon as that deadline passed, I knew I was being disobedient. And all of a sudden, you know, I woke up that morning. I'm like, I should have done it. I was unfaithful to what the Lord put in my heart because of fear. Because I didn't feel like I could do it. That was the reason why I didn't do it. And that's disobedience. That's not faith in God. That's not knowing that God can use me, God can strengthen me. That's doubt. And I knew the moment that I had missed that deadline, I had been unfaithful and I had been disobedient. And that's what walking with the Lord is, knowing his voice, hearing him. And as soon as we disobey, we know. The Lord is faithful to tell us, no, you missed it. You, you heard my voice, but you didn't follow through. But he gives second chances, though. The Lord's good with that. But I want to leave you with a story, too, which I just loved. Um, and I will finish, honestly. Um, and it's a story from Kenneth McRae. I don't really know him. Um, he's Scottish, though. And he said that he remembers when... This is him speaking. He says, I remember when I was a young divinity student being unexpectedly called upon to take the service in the congregation at which I used to worship as a small boy. It was also the church that the great Dr. Kennedy had exercised his ministry. I don't know Dr. Kennedy. Maybe you do. I don't know him. But I guess he was great. I felt overwhelmed at the thought throughout the day. And after the evening service, I felt greatly depressed and troubled and downcast. The church officer, a worthy man named Alexander McLean, locally known as Sandy Clunas. I don't know why he was known as Sandy Clunas. I don't know where you get Sandy Clunas from Alexander McLean, you know. (laughs) Is Alexander McLean here? Oh, you mean Sandy Clunas. Okay. But Alexander McLean, locally known as Sandy Clunas, was waiting for me in the vestry. He was built of a large size and a very encouraging man. When I came into the vestry, he put his big arms around me and said, Never you mind, my boy. As Mr. Finless of Helmsdale says, It is not well done, good and successful servant. It is well done, good and faithful servant. It's not your success that the Lord's looking for. The Lord's not looking for you to be the biggest thing that Mansfield's ever seen. The Lord's just looking for your faithfulness. That's all he wants, just that faithfulness. And when we're faithful, we leave the results up to him. And he will cultivate that, which he needs to. He will take that faithfulness, and he will make the fruit that he wants to make from that faithfulness. So let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God, that your faithfulness, Lord, is your character, it's your nature. Lord, that your word is faithful. It is established in the heavens. Lord, that is where our safety is. That is where our security is. And Lord, we just want to put our eyes on you and rest in your faithfulness. Lord, I pray that we would take a humbling look at ourselves. Lord, that we would recognize those areas that we are unfaithful in. And Lord, that we would give them to you. We would acknowledge them and ask for your strength. Ask for your comfort your wisdom, and that you will enable us to walk in faithfulness. Lord, may we look and examine our circumstances, our calling and the commitments that we have before us. And may we make sure that we're doing it to honor and glorify you and that we are faithful to our commitments, that our yes is yes and that our no is no. And Lord, that we become dependable and reliable servants. Lord, servants that will serve you and bless your people. Servants that will have a name, that we are dependable and that we can be relied upon. Lord, we ask these things in your name.